All right, here we go. Hold your ears, folks. It's showtime. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and what do you think it means to live a meaningful life? I mean, I thought all that mattered was how much money you have. No? I mean, is that not what we're doing here? To help me and you learn how to live a meaningful life, we welcome the author of Soul in the Game, Vitaly Katzenelson. In our headlines, ever have a non-compete? The rules may be changing. We'll explain. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to David, who wants some help with a career change for a family member. And then, I'll have some meaningful trivia. And now, two guys who find their meaning in helping you build your Benjamins, <laughs> Yes, I guess find love and happiness too. It's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. Oh, good news for you, stackers. You made it to Wednesday. You're now halfway through your week, and it is smooth sailing from here till Friday. We're going to make sure it is at least for the next... 60 minutes. I'm Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And the gentleman who's going to help you buckle up, Buttercup, and get your money in order, it's Mr. OG. On the downhill side of June already. Can you believe it? Already. Can you believe that? I feel like we were just talking about, uh, you know, we, we always begin the year with motivational stories and get your debt paid off. And I feel like we did that last week. <laughs> like we totally just did that. And now. Poof, it's halfway through the year. No. Second half of the year. And that is a good question for people, OG. We, we I haven't mean, even gotten summer to start. Yeah, right. Not to get too serious, too early in the show, but where are those New Year's resolutions? What have you done? You've listened to half a year of us, and there's so many things that you could have been doing just to build yourself a better portfolio. Have you done it? It's a good time to look in the mirror, I think. It kind of sounded like you said, Essentially, you've wasted half a year listening to us and you haven't done a thing <laughs> because we keep giving Get it you, together. <laughs> I know we keep giving you great advice every show. What do you want from us? Three days a week. Phenomenal stuff, Doug. It's about time to move. Come on. We're beating you over the head with it and you can't put the PlayStation <laughs> controller down. You can lead a stacker to money, but you can't make them pick it up. Right. We got a great show. We're going to try again today. Vitali. Katz and Nelson is a gentleman who's one of the top money managers in the United States. He is a wonderful story as like so many people, an immigrant and a guy who's thought not just about money, but about values. And, and really as Doug, you so eloquently said earlier, getting the most out of life. But before that news, we had news Monday from the securities and exchange commission. And they're not the only government entity who is maybe changing the game when it comes to your money, the federal trade commission, working now on your work life. We're going to talk about that. But before all that, with the 15th pick, the Milwaukee Bucks select, you know their name, Giannis Adetokounmpo. Now discover their journey. Papa always talks about opportunity. What if this is it? Based on the true story. Give it your all. Of a family who risked everything. I can get you all sent back home. To rise together. Show them who we are. I will rise. Disney's Rise. Rated PG. Parental guidance suggested. Streaming Friday on Disney+. Plus. We're all juggling life, a career, and trying to build a little bit of wealth. The Brown Ambition Podcast with host Mandy and Tiffany the Budget Nista can help. If you guys have listened with us from the beginning, I mean, we were just like two single girls when we started off. You've seen us get married. You see Mandy have a beautiful baby. It's like this living diary. I know. When are we ever going to have time to sit down and listen to 300 hours? I don't know. (laughs) But it's out there at least. Brown Ambition. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Vitelli, Katz, and Nelson, and the Federal Trade Commission, pinch me. It's a wonderful Wednesday. Let's get moving. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. This piece comes to us from the Wall Street Journal. It's written by Dave Michaels and uh, Ryan Tracy. 
Uh, Federal Trade Commission considers restricting the use of non-compete clauses by companies. Oh, gee, I don't know if you saw this piece. Ooh, did not. Federal Trade Commission Chairwoman Lena Khan said the agency is considering a new regulation to restrict the use of of non-compete clauses by companies which she said hurt lower wage workers and can stifle competition for talent. So she's saying, hey, go ahead and steal the talent. (laughs) Go ahead and steal the talent because uh, non-competes. But really, non-competes, OG, let's talk about this. Have you ever had to sign a non-compete? Probably somewhere in all of that stuff from American Express way back when. We made Doug sign a non-compete when he came here. On a napkin. Yeah, because you knew what treasure you were getting. But in your professional you didn't want life, this going to any other podcast. That's right. In your professional life, and you forgot during that negotiation to say, "I'll sign the non compete if you throw in a t shirt." And now we hold it against you every episode. <laughs> I thought I was pretty savvy, but <laughs> missed the mark. At that point, I didn't even know there were free t shirts. I I remember that negotiation, Doug. OG leans over and goes, "He didn't even ask for the t shirt." Or money. You should fire your agent. <laughs> Doug's like, I know I forgot something. Oh, crap. I forgot the free t-shirt and the money part of the clause. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, but those aren't in, none, neither of those things are in non-competes. You guys know this. Yes. Uh, yeah. I think in my professional life, I signed non-competes in just about every job after my first, you know, you know first one out of school. But honestly, I would say that they're, they're pr- I don't know where we're going with this, but I'll dive in and say, they're really difficult to enforce. You'll almost never get chased down for one unless you've really been successful somewhere else and your previous employer spots that and or that you've been really successful somewhere else at their expense because you've stolen their clients and taken them with you, that sort of thing. But otherwise, I don't know anybody who's ever been chased down with somebody waving a non-compete clause. What happens in the financial planning business or financial industry quite a bit? Uh, it used to happen a lot. And then there was kind of like this agreement amongst everybody to not do it. And then companies have started to say, well, we're going to go after advisors again. But um, again, to your point, it doesn't really hold up very well. It's a bad look for Merrill, the trillion dollar behemoth to go after little old broker in Sioux City, you know, Iowa or whatever, you know, because, because, uh, he left with his 17 clients and you know what I mean? It's just like, it's, it looks ugly for that. Yeah. Uh, so that's probably part of the reason that it's not enforced as much or used as much. Yeah. The piece says that, uh, non-compete agreements typically bar employees from joining competitor for a period after they quit. Long associated with higher paid salaried employees, companies have increasingly made them a condition of hire for hourly workers as well, which kind of surprises me. Quote, we feel an enormous amount of urgency given how much harm is happening against the workers. Ms. Khan said in an interview Tuesday, this is the type of practice that falls squarely in our wheelhouse. Uh, So restricting the use. I don't see how it helps anything, honestly. When you look at the, uh, from a competition standpoint, if you're the best there is, why should you not be able to go where you want to go? Play for the team that you want to play for. If they want to restrict your ability to move, then you have to have some sort of remuneration for that. I mean, look at like football contracts. We think you're really good. We would like you on our team. And here's the money to prove how much we think we want you here. And then if you say, well, I don't want to play anymore, then you have to pay to leave. You know what I mean? Like there's the... There's the back and forth, you know, that you agree to do this in exchange for this, you know, this level of security. And I think the missing piece out of non-competes kind of in the corporate world is I don't get anything for it. Yeah. You're telling me I can't go play for the other team. All right, cool. Then write me a big check. (laughs) You know, give me a signing bonus like they do Peyton Manning. And I won't go play for the other team. So not even commenting on what the Federal Trade Commission's doing, OG, you like the restricting use of non-competes just if you're a business owner. Like, come on, I don't need to play this game. Let's let people move and play for the team they want to play for. And I think like Doug said, it's exceedingly expensive to go after. And by the time you get to the point where you have won the case, you can barely 
get in front of it before it happens. You know, like what's the outcome that you're trying to get to? Tarnish somebody? Like, oh, Doug's a bad guy because he went into a different podcast. It's like, yeah. what? what is it? Like, I should just spend that energy getting better at my business or go finding a better Doug or whatever the case may be. Yeah, right. Or doing what I need to do to to keep the one that I have. You know, if, if an employee says, I want to leave, the last thing that you want to do is be like, good luck. I'll see you in court. You better go work at a McDonald's, you know, type of thing. Like what kind of... It just seems punitive at that point. It's like, really? If they don't want to be here, why do I want them? Yeah. yeah and if it's purely a money thing, write the check. There was once a guy who worked for this evil empire who said, at Michigan, we want a Michigan man. I believe that was the quote. Okay. So, you're talking about Bo Schembechler. Why are you bringing him in here? What's that got to do with anything? You guys are talking about, we want people that want to work here. Why would I restrict people going someplace else? We want people yeah. that are going to want to work here. I mean, I don't know why anybody would want to work in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Like, why you would want to do that is beyond me. However... If somebody's a Stacky Benjamins person, we want Stacky Benjamins people. That's what we yeah. want. If you don't want to be a Stacky Benjamins person, go someplace else. I think that's what Bo was saying, right? Was that way too far a reach? Like we, I thought for sure we were talking about exactly that. That's like that's exactly well, the point I think you were, we were making. Pretty close to that, you know. On a, I think what's totally analogous there, Joe, is I was playing golf yesterday and I was looking for a golf ball that had strayed off of the fairway, Straight. and instead I found this beautiful. <laughs> I had found this beautiful, Titleist. Pro six that had a Spartan logo on it. And I just chucked that piece of right into the, into the woods. <laughs> so I think that's pretty much the same thing. Did you, did you really? I totally did. So I was, I was playing golf. It was in a, a perfect title. I was playing golf in a charity tournament a few years ago. And, uh, and I come up to this ball and I just think it's mine. And I hit the ball and I hit it great. And my buddy comes up. He's like, dude, what are you doing? I'm like, what? I just hit a great shot. He's like, that was my ball. I go, what do you mean? It was your ball. That was my ball. He's like, I'm golfing with a Titleist. What, what's it called? A Pro V6? Is that what it is? They say Pro V1. Pro V1. I, I say Pro, Pro V something. Anyway, this really expensive golf ball. He's like, yours is the one that says Wilson on it. <laughs> Costco. He's like, how could you mistake? <laughs> how could you mistake the Kmart golf ball with my Titleist golf ball? I've, I've, Costco golf balls are good. Yeah. yeah, nearly as good. You almost can't tell the difference between a Costco golf ball and the top golf ball. No, actually, they got sued by Titleist. I think it was Titleist because they were they pretty much copied their ball exactly. And they, for the first couple, three years that there were Kirkland golf balls, they were, you were basically buying Titleist balls. They, they got, maybe this was a non-compete to bring it back full circle. They got sued by Titleist and had to change the dimple pattern or something. But that's but they that's still, a different thing. That's a product, right? That's a, well, that's a thing that you can copyright or trademark. Well, but there is some correlation there because while I think it's going to be very rare for a company to go after an employee because they left, because their amazing Doug left. If they're taking with them IP and they're using and they're sharing that IP with their new employer, yeah. for all we know, that's what happened. Somebody, some smart person at Titleist moved over to Kirkland and said, here, let me help Here's you Here's the map. Yeah. I brought a, a lathe machine. That's when they're going to enforce a non-compete, sure. but it's pretty, pretty rare, especially at the hourly level that somebody's going to be able to do that. Let's talk about non-compete to make this actionable, OG. If I get a non-compete put in my face and my employer wants me to sign it, obviously, I think I have to think about signing it if I'm gonna you if do. I'm gonna work there, right? If I'm gonna be a part of that team, like what do I do? Do I tell them I want to take it to my attorney first? Do I try to negotiate that? Like what do I sign it knowing that it's hard to enforce? Like what do you do with the non-compete? Doug's answer is sign it and come at me, bro. Yeah. Yeah, you want to go on the field trip, you sign the permission slip. And then you still sue him later when the, when the goat kicks you in the I would shins. drag it out. See, I had a different scenario with that. We had a situation at our kid's school where it was this, um, it was during COVID, but it was a CYA about COVID, right? It was like, hey, we can't guarantee that your kids are going to be safe here. We don't know what this disease does, yada, yada, yada. You can't sue us. Which I was like, all right, I get that. But then there was like 10 more paragraphs of like, and since we're having you sign stuff. <laughs> also, if anything else happens to your kid while they're here, 
COVID related or not, that's not our responsibility. And we can't get, you know, like all this other sort of like, hey, since we've got you on this thing, we might as well have you do this thing too. And I remember reading through it and I did have our attorney look at it. He's like, no way in heck would I sign that. And so we didn't. And they're like, hey, you guys got to sign that. I'm like, oh yeah, we're having the attorney look at it. I just kept dragging it out. And then finally they stopped talking about it. Because I think there were enough people that were like, hmm, eh, I mean, I don't think so. I get it, right? But I'm not going to like. But do you abdicate. take that chance when you're, yeah, do you take that chance, OG, when your paycheck is on the line? Like you got this job, they've accepted you, now you're in the HR office and they're Depends. like, I mean, are you, you know, are you working an hourly job at the print shop, you know, <laughs> or are you, are you working for NASA and you just came up with like the next space shuttle rocket or something? I mean, it depends on where you are. I, I think, I think it's totally reasonable. Like Doug said, if you've got some sort of IP or you have, you know, something along those lines, I do disagree with the fact that the, you know, people say, Hey, if you create something while you work for us, it's ours. Like that, that's oh, yeah. also BS. It's like, no, that's my intellectual capital that created this thing. And they'll even extend that in that employment contract to like things you create outside, right? If you're working in your basement mm-hmm. and you just happen to be working for, you know, stacking Benjamins mm-hmm. and then you create a, something else is like, well, we own part of that too. You know, we reserve the right to own it basically, which I think is totally stupid. But um, again, maybe a very difficult thing to enforce. But. I'm, I'm glad you feel that way, OG, because that means when one day you find my other three podcasts that I'm working on, uh, you won't come after me. As long as they're paying the same as we do. <laughs> no issues. But it kind of depends. If you're just working and you don't give a crap, then sign it and see what happens. You know, I think you can also say, oh, okay, let me review this and I'll get back to you and just see if it goes away. Cause you're also relying on them to have really good follow-up for you not signing that one form. And whose fault is it that it's not signed yours or theirs? Right? So maybe the HR people are a little lazy in their follow through and that, that could benefit you. So why not? Especially if it's like, if it's part of like the onboarding part of your work, if you get hired and they're like, here's the 20 things you have to sign they're probably not going to hire you unless you sign all 20 things. But if you're already working there and then they go, oh, hey, by the way, you got this thing. Here's another thing. I would be like, yeah. uh, uh, chew. I've got a little something. I'll be back in a couple days and I'll let you know. Coming up next, Vitaly Katzenelson is chief investment officer at IMA. He's the author of several books, including the little book of Sideways Markets and active value investing. And while his focus usually is on discovering undervalued companies, he has written extensively about what is life really about. And he's packaged it all into a book. And this book recommended by so many people across the top of it, General Stanley McChrystal talks about what a phenomenal book this is. Book is also recommended by some of the biggest and deepest thinkers in the world today, and you're about to hear him talk about how do we have meaning in our life. We'll also talk about a little bit about his story, immigrating from Russia, and uh, some of the lessons he learned growing up as a Jewish man in a communist country. What a story. Vitaly Kaltzenelson up next, but to get there, Doug, I think you got some trivia for us, my friend. Darn right I do, Joe. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And if I wanted to live a meaningful life, I think I should have been a fireman instead of a globally famous podcast host. Just the other day, Joe's mom had her Depression-era vibrating exerciser belt plugged in on high, as well as her wax heater and coffee warmer. And then she also had the electric scooter getting all charged up. I smelled something funny, jumped over the couch, karate kicked the power strip right out of the wall. Of course, it turns out what I smelled was Joe burning another batch of Tostino's pizza rolls. But anyway, I was right there. I mean, I was on it. Speaking of fires, my question today is, what city's river caught fire, prompting the creation of the EPA? I'll be back with the answer after I go see if the fillings in those pizza rolls are salvageable. Well, I made a decision this last time I moved OG. I am never moving again. Don't get me wrong. I love our new house. Not even new house, but I love the house that's new to us. But um, yeah, I'm done. Never again. Going to die in that place? (laughs) That's your forever house? (laughs) That is it. Hopefully in the middle of a podcast, because think about the ratings on that show. 
<laughs> Did you listen to that episode where that dude died while he was podcasting? Wouldn't that be great? No? Uh, okay. Wow. <laughs> this got dark in a hurry. <laughs> Maybe, maybe that. guess that's what you think would be great radio. <laughs> I mean, you give it a whirl. I'll let you know. Navy Federal Credit Union is here to help military members and their families tackle homeownership, OG. Did you know that? I did. They offer mortgage options with zero down payment. So they don't need, you don't need, rather, so you don't need to wait years to save. They offer mortgage options that don't require private mortgage insurance. So you'll save money each month. Members save $2,500 on average when they choose Navy Federal for their mortgage with resources like Realty Plus, you can get an experienced real estate agent. They're a top VA home lender. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. Insured by NCUA, equal housing lender. Hey there, stackers. I'm fire safety sucker and burnt tongue talker Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. So I don't know if you're aware of this, but rivers not supposed to catch on fire. But in the summer of 69, not only did I get my first real six string, of course I bought it at a five and dime, and played it till my fingers bled, all that happened, and on June 22nd, an oil slick in the Cuyahoga River caught fire. Subsequent press helped lead to the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency. So what city was that river in? Cleveland! And now, here's Vitaly Katzenelson. And I'm so happy we finally got Fatali into mom's basement. It's about time, my friend. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really excited. Well, I'm excited. I very much enjoyed reading about your life and and I've read your work in the past, uh, many things that you've written. And this is obviously a big departure for you talking through so many different things. Why a book like this? Why a uh, soul in the game at all? Freddie Mercury has this song where he says, there must be more to life than this. And maybe 10, 15 years ago, there must be more to life than just investing. So this is when I started writing about more than just investing in stocks and economy, etc., but about life in general. And this book basically started out as a collection of my articles about life, non-investment articles. And then I ended up writing almost another half of the book, in you know, in the process of putting it together, so it's a, it's just this. I, I like my previous books were really kind of written for professionals yeah. or you know, your neighborhood dentist. This one is written for, since I'm probably eighty percent of my audience is male, so I'd argue it's this is written for the wives of my normal readers. So I, <laughs> <laughs> Dad, are you saying just because it's more well rounded that it's much? Well, I, I just I think it just you know it's the the boring topics that like I'll give a perfect example. So I wrote two investment books. My wife has not read a single one of them, <laughs> but she has read this one. So that's <laughs> there, put it this way. there it is. That's the litmus test. Well, it is a book that's far much more about the value, which I think, you know, for people like you and I, you know, during your life, and this resonates all through your work, that it's much more than about the numbers, right? If it's just a collection of numbers and, and a stack of Benjamins, it's not that much. So what I'd like to do actually is... Start off kind of where you start in the book. I'd love to, if you could share some stories from your early years growing up in Russia and being Jewish in Russia, I think would have been very difficult. And I'd love to hear some of the lessons that you learned growing up. So I grew up in Murmansk, Russia. So most readers would not know where it is unless I tell them that the Red October, the fictional submarine from Tom Clancy's novel, the Red October, came from Murmansk. So we're going to meet Sean Connery if we go there, is what you're saying. That, that, exactly, exactly. But if you look at the map of Russia, if you look up and left, and you look very high up at the very top, where, like, you know, the, at the top of Norway and Finland, that's where Murmansk is. The winters are incredibly cold, and there's very little sun. In fact, like for a couple months a year, the sun would show up for 10 or 15 minutes a day. So I would go to school in the morning. The sun would show up at noon for about 10 minutes. I will be in the classroom. And when I walk back, it's dark again. So I'm, I walk to school in darkness, come back home in darkness as well. So like, I would argue that uh, Seattle looks like a sunshine city <laughs> <laughs> compared to Murmansk. But anyway, so Murmansk was probably a little bit less anti-Semitic than many other parts of Russia. And the reason for that, because 
it's a city of immigrants. It's a so far north. And uh, there's very few indigenous people who actually lived there for a long time. So most people came from Murmansk from different parts of Soviet Union. So it was a lot more of a melting pot of a city than many other cities in the uh, Soviet Union. So there was a lot less anti-Semitism, but there was still, like, I think the best way I can describe being Jewish in, in Russia is that like, you belong to less valuable caste. Like, think of our caste system. So you had this kind of super caste, which would be Russians, Ukrainian, Belarusians, kind of pure Slavic, you know, kind of races. And then you had other castes that were like Georgians or Armenians who were considered to be a little bit less important or less valuable people or less, you know, than the kind of the pure Russians or pure Slavic class. And Jews, ironically, even though you, you can kind of tell the difference between, let's say, Georgian and Russian, right? Georgians or Armenians, they have different language. They look ethnically a little bit different. Jews they kind of look this very very Russian. Like you couldn't really tell the difference between a Jewish person and a kind of a Russian person. That's what I was actually wondering was how would somebody know that you were Jewish? In Russia, in your passport, there was this line six in the passport that said, what's your ethnicity or nationality? And my ethnicity was Jewish, which is weird because this is where it gets more complicated because it's been Jewish a religion or nationality. And I would argue it's both. Yeah. The reason that it's, it's both because until I was 18 years old, you have to believe me on this, I did not even know that there was a Jewish religion. So in 1980s, 70s, 80s, there was very little religion in Russia, period. Any religion. Sure. The religion was the opiate for the people or something. Like this is one of the lines from yeah. the Soviet. So yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, so I did not even realize that, you know, there was a, such thing as Judaism and there was a Jewish religion. So I was Jewish because my parents were Jewish, just like the same way Armenian people were Armenian because their parents were Armenians, okay? And so the, I always felt a little bit like, you know, I'm not as good as everybody else. Just, the, you know, and there was something wrong with me, even though I did not know what it was. But I think... There is a slight benefit from this, which is kind of interesting. You, did, you don't think about it this way. But my parents always, because the external environment was kind of hard, you know, there was some harshness in the external environment, my parents always overcompensated for that by telling me how special I am and how much they love me. And that actually ended up being extremely valuable for me because I felt like I'm special because they told me that I'm special and they had to do this a lot more because of the harsh environment. And I would argue that was an incredible, that gave me a lot of fuel to achieve things in life, a lot more than I would have otherwise. One of my favorite movies, which was made, I think, in the 70s, called uh, Men of La Mancha. It's a musical, Don Quixote musical, and it has a Peter O'Toole and Sophie Loren. I read Don Quixote when I was, I don't know, 12 or 13 years old. I don't remember anything except he was fighting the uh, uh, windmills. But in that musical, one thing I realized why this story that's 400 years old is still, is still alive today. There was this moment where Don Quixote, who is basically an old man that went mad, you could argue, see this woman played by Sophie Loren, who is basically... You know, she's basically a prostitute, but he looks at her and he sees in her as this lady. And he starts calling her Dulcinea. And he starts treating her as a lady. And she's shocked by this because she, all, throughout all her life, she'd been treated like a prostitute that she was, right? And this guy starts treating her and calling her, treating her like a lady. And at the end of the movie, she starts behaving like a lady. And that impacts the way he saw in her more than she saw in herself changes her behavior. And I would argue that as a parent today, my job is to instill this confidence in my kids that if they work hard enough, the talent is already there. They just have to work on this. So they are, they are special. It's a very interesting balance. You, as a parent, you want to... Tell your kids, my father always told me this story, that talent is something that you can't just bury it. And it's not a tree that you can just bury it and it's going to grow. You have to constantly water it. So I tell my kids that they're special 
but they still have to work very, very hard to bring this, you know, you know, the special outside. You know, it's not, it's not going to go by itself. Yeah, there's got to be, you have to uh, water it and nurture it. And I love this idea of confidence, about protecting your kids' confidence and making them confident. Because I, w- I would imagine in that type of society, it'd be so easy to not be very confident. And there was a lot of sacrifice for you growing up as well. I know you learned a lot from your mom and some of the sacrifices that your mom had. Tell me a little bit about what you learned from your mother. Yeah, so my so my my mom fell in love with my father and she like she grew up in this this very old Russian city called Saratov, where she had a sheltered existence in the sense that her parents would take her to the uh, symphony once or twice a week. My mom played piano. She had she you know and uh, and then she falls in love with my father and moves to this. Oh God, it's a this hellhole in the middle of nowhere right. where <laughs> there, there, there is zero culture. It's a, it really, literally was a hellhole because it's a city port where there's a lot of drunken seamen kind of thing. And she moves this to the city because she fell in love with my father. And um, she always put her, you know, whatever her needs were, she always put those needs secondary to us. She wanted to make sure that we are well fed, which is in Russia was a big task, by the way, well dressed, but also that we studied in school. I'll give an example. Uh, I was in, I remember I was in second or third grade and she said, listen, at my work, we have this uh, the, the math Olympics. And if you do this problems, if you do them all right, then you win something. Obviously, she made the whole thing up, so I would do extra math. It's, it's, you know, <laughs> but those tricks, you know, those little things, that's why I worked maybe a little more on math or reading, etc. She sacrificed her career as well when you the family moved, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so my father is a very, very accomplished teacher at this prestigious university. And uh, he had a PhD in electrical engineering. And so he worked and he was the breadwinner. But also, it's more than that. He was this intellectual who also was an inventor, you know, in, in addition to everything else. So my father lived in his world where he was, a, my mom basically allowed him to dedicate himself to his profession. And she took care of the family. This is not like your traditional housewife who has a barely completed uh, uh, high school. She, you know, my mom has a master's degree in physics and she played violin, but she felt for our family to function well, she had to give up her career and dedicate it to us. When my mom got sick with uh, brain cancer, I remember, the last memory I remember of her is that her worrying about something about my brother's test in high school or something, and she was not worrying about her brain cancer. That's, that's the kind of person she was. Uh, You also had some great lessons from your dad. Obviously, being a Jewish professor at a university, I could see how there would be, he might have a lot more anti-Semitism thrown his way than you would as a kid. And yet he was a very much a respected professor at the university. And also, you can see in your writing how much you learned about not caving to pressure. There was a lot of bribery at the time and people were often bribing your dad. And yet he very much uh, stuck to his morals. Yes. And my father was always very proud of this. Like in Russia, bribery was like you tipping in Dennis. Like it's just, that was part of life. And uh, you could buy your grades. My father never, ever took bribes. And he was incredibly proud of this. This is why we had a more modest existence than maybe right. some of his colleagues. But you could have made a lot more money, had a lot more money growing up, probably. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, it would be a very, very profitable hobby. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so my father was, a, he never took bribes. And he was very proud of this. But I'll tell you this, it's, it actually was much more than this. He was also a very accomplished artist. And if you are watching this interview, you can see all the paintings behind me are my father's. Oh, yeah. And so when we moved to the United States, he was not teaching anymore. But he was lucky that he was able to embrace the hobby that he had all his life, which is the painting in water, watercolor and oil. But even then, as an artist in the United States, he would never paint what would sell. He would paint what was interesting to him. As an artist, it was very important to him to be kind of true to himself. 
the reason I call the book Soul in a Game, because game, that is something that when you're doing something that you absolutely love, that you can't live without, okay? Something where you would not, where financial benefits to you are secondary. It's not, you know, you're not waking up in the morning because you're thinking, I'm going to do this and I'm going to make money. Money is always secondary, as always was for my father when it came to teaching, and that's why he never took bribes, or being an artist. But when you choose a game, let me give you this example. I work out twice a week with a trainer, and I work out because I have to, not because I want to. Because I, when I get older, I want to make sure that I'm healthy. That's the only reason I'm working out. If you told me, Vitaly, I'll give you a pill, and just basically you would, would not have to experience any pain of working out, and you would still be healthy. You would still get the benefits of you know, working out without experiencing all the pain. I would take this pill in a heartbeat because I really don't enjoy working out. It just I do this because I have to, okay? So I have very little soul in the game when I work out. Now, if you told me, Vitaly, this book that took you a year to write, okay? And uh, by the way, I enjoy writing, but it's a... I experience a lot of pain when I write. It's a, I love writing, but I don't love writing all the time. There's a lot of pain you go through when you write. And I'm sure, Joe, you know, you probably went through the same thing when you wrote your book. Yeah, pure joy all the time, every, every yeah. moment. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But if I could skip the process of writing the book and the book just suddenly happened, I would not do that because the process itself, even though it's often painful at times, that's the problem that gives me meaning in life. I love that idea because I remember writing my book, it forced me to explore some things and be comfortable with some things that I was uncomfortable with. And I think that's probably what you're getting at is that you have to kind of sit with this discomfort and explore it. And what does it really mean to me uh, in my existence? That's exactly right. And there was also pain that came with that process because it was not always pleasure. But that pain, it's what I would call a good problem. It's the pain that gives you meaning in life. Okay. So what I'm trying to say, when you choose a game, you want to choose a game where if somebody gave you a lot of money and said, you can basically, like imagine writing a book where you skip the whole process of writing and it just happens. Okay. What, to me, I would never take this money because the process itself is as important to me as the product itself. Now you can see the difference how when I work out, I have very little soul in the game. And when I write or invest, you know, I'm talking about writing, but I could say the same thing about investing. Any creative activity is going to have always a certain amount of pain. And I would argue that happiness in life comes from having good problems. And you're gonna, if you have activities where you have soul in the game, which have meaning to you, where you have good problems, you're more likely to have a happy life. And what does it mean having soul in the game? Soul in the game in heaven is an identity. It's your identity or it's your attitude. It's, that's the soul part, how you look at these problems. And so my father always, you know, financial benefits were secondary. He had skin in the game. In other words, in the book, I talk about this uh, guy, Jiro, who made, uh, who had a sushi. three-star Michelin. He made, yes. And imagine if you have sushi, but, you don't eat the sushi. You only give it to other people to eat, but you don't, you don't eat it. So then you have no skin in the game. So when you have skin in the game, you share the upside and the downside, right? So I run an investment firm and all of my liquid net worth is invested in the same stocks my clients own. So I share not just the upside when they do well, but also the downside if portfolio doesn't do well. But also when you have a soul in the game, what you do is a net positive to society. Imagine I make sushi, but uh, I think this is actually going to make my whoever consumes it sick, right? It's very difficult to, sell, to have a soul in a game if whatever you make makes it people sick. Anyway, so that's kind of the concept of soul in a game that I discuss in the book. And I, when I look at my father, I see a person who had that. So he's my role model in life because a person who had a soul in a game, both in the game he chose, games he chose, and the way he behaved. You have uh, some tenants around soul in the game, and I'd like to just briefly go over those. These are sacred taboos you write. They won't break them for financial benefit. For an artisan, the love of his craft is his primary motivation. Financial considerations are always secondary. You just covered that. Artisans are students of life for life. 
I love that because it's, it is much more about learning than it is about, well, it's about learning, but it's also learning about you. One thing I wonder actually, even as I'm reading these Vitelli is that, you know, you deal with this construct called money, which is this, you know, it's a, almost a pure numbers game. Is it hard to be an artisan of value investing, right? It, your dad makes paintings, you know, has these beautiful works of art. How do you become an artisan of money management? You know, just like an artist, uh, just like a sculptor uh, looks at the rock as the kind of raw material, I look at money as the raw material. That, that's how it is. If you think about investing, there's a Stoic philosopher, Seneca, has this saying, time discovers truth. And if you think about investing, that's what I try to do. When we analyze a company, we try to figure out how much is it worth, which is basically based on what its cash flow is going to be in the long run. So what I try to do at work is kind of discover truth intellectually and practically before time does. Okay, so the money is just a raw material, really. But it's a very intellectual journey. It's an intellectual journey where you get to learn a lot. And I, like I'm a generalist, so it means I don't just concentrate on one industry. So I get to learn about, I, I look at my portfolio and I have a company in healthcare. At some point, I even wrote a little book about it. Spent a lot of time analyzing the car industry and wrote a book about Tesla. Tesla, yeah. Yeah. And so it's an incredible intellectual journey where you get to be a student of life because you're constantly learning. I went on this huge journey of learning about the electric car industry. And uh, when I wrote this little book about Tesla, we still did not buy Tesla stock. And you would argue I wasted all this time of learning. But, well, that knowledge actually helped me to buy companies in adjacent industries. Ah, uh, yeah. But even if you don't buy the stock... I think it's time well spent. I mean, just because you didn't buy it, you know specifically why you didn't buy it. Yeah, and not buying is a decision as well. So it's right, a- yeah. <laughs> and I'm glad you brought that up because I really like the middle piece of your book, which is all about lessons learned from travel and different places that you've been. But I want to skip to some of the lessons that you've learned about yourself and some of the little tweaks to your lifestyle with a little time we have together. When you talk about decision making, you kick off this part of the book with you don't eat dessert. And I think that once again, just like you didn't buy Tesla, I don't eat dessert is something that you didn't do. Talk about what that's a metaphor for, because this is a metaphor used for a bigger decision-making process that you use. Yeah. So when I'm in Denver, I don't eat sugar, anything sugar related. So I don't eat cakes, ice cream, et cetera. So then so- you just never go to Denver. Uh, (laughs) I I actually did the math and I found I spent about 92% of my time in Denver. So I don't need desserts. You know, I just kind of put it in the category of desserts. What's interesting about this, it's a, what I call it, a half binary decision. In other words, it's just, I don't. So when somebody gives me a cake, I said, I don't need desserts. And so it's a non-decision decision that I lose very little energy when I do this. Because if I did not eat desserts some of the time, but not all the time, every single time I saw a sugary object in front of me, I would have to make a decision. Every time you make a decision, that consumes energy. Now, if you make the decision later in the day, you probably have less willpower energy left. So you may actually succumb to it. So the fact that I I don't eat dessert is my identity when I'm in Denver, and we can talk about the other 8%, uh, then it makes my life a lot easier. And actually, it makes me healthier because it's not a choice that I consider. So I'll give you one example. I have this friend who is a rabbi. He was a very religious rabbi in my house. And he was complaining that he eats too much bread. I told him a story about the identity, and I told him that just become a person who doesn't need bread. He said, I can't do this. I said, you do this all the time. He said, what do you mean? Well, he said, do you eat pork? He said, no, I don't eat pork. I said, well, just tell yourself. And I said, if I gave you just a little bit of bacon, would you eat it? He said, no, I'm a person who doesn't eat pork. I said, just approach bread the same way as the way you approach pork. He called me a few months later and he told me he lost like, I don't know, 10 or 20 pounds. Wow. Just doing that. 
Yeah, very little stress. Just I don't do that. You're also obsessed with good sleep. Yeah. Well, see, if you think about this, there are so many things you can do for your health. You know, you can eat well. You can uh, exercise. You can reduce stress. And you can sleep. And and uh, what you find is sleep is one of the most important medicines in our lives. You know, you know, it's a when you go to sleep, it's kind of your brain basically. This is the time your brain relaxes, and it's basically cleanses. So, I so what happened to me when I was working on that infamous Tesla book? I was so excited about the subject that I would basically I would research it late into the night. I would wake up earlier than usual, like at four in the morning. And I sacrificed sleep just to do this book. And then one day I come to see my stepmom and she tells me, you look horrible. And I had these bags under my eyes. I did look horrible because I was sleep deprived for a month. And so this is when I read a book by um, uh, Matthew Walker, uh, Why We Sleep. And, And I realized how important sleep is. And basically sleep is one of the most important things we can do for our health. The problem in our society we sleep is that we have this saying that has probably hurt more people than, I don't know, maybe as much as sugar did. I'll sleep when I'm dead. We always look at sleep as something I can sacrifice so I can find more time in a day. And I would argue that's incredibly dangerous because there's a lot of studies that found that if you sacrifice sleep, you you're not going to be as creative. Uh, you're more likely to be in a car accident than uh, causes of Alzheimer. There is a whole laundry list of how bad lack of sleep is for you. So I'm not going to go through that. But what I also found is actually requires work to get good sleep. So to get a good sleep, you have to uh, not read on your devices at least an hour before you go to sleep. You have to have a very dark room. You have to sleep in a room, like I sleep in a room that's 65% uh, 65 degrees temperature. It's, it has to be lower than a room temperature. What actually helps you to fall asleep, surprisingly, if you take a hot shower before you go to sleep, hmm. because you think it goes against what I told you, that you have to be in a lower temperature. But what happens is that when you take a hot shower, it, it opens the pores of your skin, and you, your body cools down much faster. Oh. Just I want you to think about the evolution. When we were in the caves, we didn't have external light. We woke up with the light, and we went to sleep with the light. Right, so we slept much longer. What happens at night? The sun goes down, the temperature drops. That's why when we sleep, we need lower temperature. So the room temperature, 72 degrees, is actually too warm for most of us. So we should be sleeping in a temperature uh, lower than the room temperature. I have to tell you, I wear this aura ring, you know, which tracks my sleep. And I am religious about my sleep because that's one of the few things I can do, I have control over, that I can do to have a healthy life. And I, I write about two hours a day. And I wake up at five in the morning, I write from five to seven every day, almost without exception. And to do this, I go to sleep early. And that's one of the things you have to do. So you have to, when you, when you think about sleeping, it's also not about just the time you wake up, it's also the time about when you go to sleep. There are so many fantastic musings and just a plethora of ideas and creativity and uh, just a fantastic read. The book is called Soul in the Game, and I'm assuming it is available everywhere this week, correct? That's right. It's available everywhere. The books are sold, yes. And if you go to soulinthegame.net, there are instructions there. If you email us the receipt that you bought the book, I'll send you four chapters that I wrote after the book already came out. Oh, so, fantastic. Yeah, soulinagame.net. Awesome. And we'll include that, Stackers, on our show notes page and also in our 201 newsletter at stackybenjamins.com slash 201. Vitaly, thanks a ton for hanging out with us and teaching us some of your life lessons. I really, really appreciate it. Joe, it's, a, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much. I'm Jen from the Frugal Friends Podcast, and when I'm not cutting the end of the toothpaste tube off to get that last little bit of toothpaste, I'm stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to Vitaly for sharing his story. What a powerful story, OG. And uh, I think makes us realize again that uh, whether it's you, me, Doug, Vitaly, whoever, Buffy on Monday, it's not about the money. It's about a more meaningful life. 
like all these discussions that we've had over the years at Stacky Benjamins, none of them truly about the money. It's about how do we get more meaning into our daily existence. Good stuff. Hey, let's uh, throw up Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, Doug, they put what you value first. Uh, what do I value at the moment? Uh, I think I value finding a truck that doesn't cost $2,000 a month. Oh my goodness. $2,000. And, and that's just the fuel bill. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> oh man. Wait, wait, wait. I don't, I don't, I'm taking a mortgage out for this truck. What? <laughs> we can save you some money, Doug, on your term life insurance premiums. How about that? And we'll also save you some oh, sweet. time. So that'll help me pay for the truck. Exactly. Yes. And it'll save you some time to do some research to maybe figure out a better way. Their application to Haven Life is simple. It's online. You get an instant coverage decision. Prices are affordable. All policies issued by their parent company, Mass Mutual, a more than 160-year-old insurer. You know, if you're listening to us right now and you need life insurance because people are relying on you for money, let's get to it. What are you waiting for? StackingBenjamins.com slash Haven Life. Get it done and go about your life. Saw a great question online. By the way, if you want to join The Basement, our Facebook group, and talk to the hive mind, a lot of our stackers happy to help you and kind of talk through some issues. Stackingbenjamins.com slash basement is the short link to get you there. That's a, a link that will automatically connect you with the Facebook page. But this one comes to us from David. David writes, hello, hive mind. I'm looking for some creative ideas to replace my mother's income. She's been installing flooring for the past decade with my father, but just tore her knee to schedule for surgery. She lives in a small town in Northern Nebraska. And I know for a fact, wouldn't be satisfied with the daily desk service job. I'm open to any ideas at this point. Has anyone else been through this with a parent in need of a career change later in life? Oh, gee, this is an issue that I wanted to bring up, not just because of the career change aspect, but this idea of a career change later in life can be, very frustrating. Like if you're, if you're in your late fifties and suddenly you need to do something different, it's a pretty scary time to try to go get another job. Yeah. Different to get a job than a career. And we do see that there's a lot of changes that happen over, over your lifetime. It, I mean, it used to be, you know, you start working at one place and you work there for 40 years or whatever, but now you're seeing lots of different shifts along the way. I think a lot of this has to do with perspective as it relates to what the beginning is, what the middle is, and what the end is. You say like, oh, I'm in my late 50s. Oh, oh I'm in my late 50s. You know, like that implies that the end is near. <laughs> so I'm too old to make a career change, right? There's lots of people who work in their 60s and 70s and even 80s. You know, we see a lot of actors and you see a lot of business owners and I was just talking to an attorney friend of mine who said that he is working on a case with an 86-year-old attorney. And I said, oh, the, the 86-year-old's your client. He goes, no, he's the attorney that I'm working with. You know, so I know a guy who just passed away in his 90s, still working two days a week as a doctor. Yeah. After he died? No, before he died. <laughs> yes. How great is you that? You couldn't oh tell God, the difference. That is a motivated dude. You couldn't tell. They just propped him up in the corner. <laughs> They figured out the practice. You just wheel this guy in and he looks the same as he did a couple days ago. Just to have somebody stand behind him and talk like him and uh, you're good. Yeah. Well, sorry to hear about that. If that's who I think it is, uh, he was our kid's doctor for a while. So fantastic gentleman. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But anyways, I mean, so there's, I think you just have to reframe the time frame. I guess, is, is a way to put it and say, well, you know, so what? So you're 50, who cares? 55, who cares? Do something different. No expiration date, unless you want one. But what do you do when you've been doing things like installing floors and now you're, you've got knee problems, OG? I mean, she's got to think really differently now about her career change. Well, maybe. What about teaching people how to install floors? What about uh, being the train-the-trainer type person? Why can't she be the person who is the expert that has everybody else, you know? You could still be in that same industry, right? Knows everything about it. Maybe now can sell the flooring that somebody else installs or, you know, there's lots of different corollary type of businesses that go in with any other business, right? Just because you're an expert at this, that probably gives you a lot of credibility in all these other areas as well. 
Yeah. Do you think it's also a time when she could just make a big pivot if she's wanted to during her life? Is this an okay time to make that, that kind of a big move? A hundred percent. Every time is the best time to do that. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you need the motivation and you can't do the the thing that you're doing anymore, now's a perfect time. But, but I think that's true for anybody, anytime. Why, why would you wait? You know what I mean? Like if nothing else over the last two and a half years, like why would you wait to do anything? Just do it. Yeah. Best time to plant a tree was yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Second yeah. best day is today. Yeah. 10 years ago and today, but okay. I think uh, I'm having two competing thoughts. Uh, thought number one, OG, is you and I have been around people before where they say, hey, I'm going to go do this thing. And in your back of your mind, you're going, yeah, that's not going to work. There is no way in hell that's going to work. And you think, you know what? You need to do just a little bit of online research and maybe apply a little bit of math before you do this before you just jump into this new thing or, or look at what the, you know, what people in that industry are talking about, maybe even talk to a few people before you start. Cause I can't think of the number of times where I'm like, Oh, that's a bad idea. And I think every time I've had that thought, it hasn't ended well, not that I'm a Nostradamus, but much more like this was such a bad idea that they never should have done it in the first place. But then in other cases, I think about people that have had really good ideas and uh, didn't have a sufficient emergency fund to get them through that rough patch when they first start out, right? Maybe there's some training they need to take or they're going to work for themselves now. And having that business plan and emergency fund, I think, are super important. But on the other side, I'm with you. If you're going to make the pivot, do it now, I think, with those couple caveats. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, if you need the motivation, this is the sign. It's like that... Um uh, I said, I don't know, it was a TikTok video or YouTube something. It said like, Lord, give me a sign. And and the, and the like bus ran off the road and hit the street sign and the street sign fell onto the person. <laughs> you know, it's like sometimes you need that like thing. You know what I mean? So you got it. Go do it. Go do your thing. You know, somebody uh, looking for some inspiration. Uh, one of my favorite podcasts is by a good friend of ours, Nick Loper, uh, Side Hustle Nation where he talks about all these crazy side hustles. We've also had Nick on the show a couple times talking about some of the ideas out there. There's plenty of ways to make money. And in our show notes page, we'll link to, uh, we'll link to Side Hustle Nation as well. Nick's a good dude, won uh, a Plutus Award for his show and had a, uh, has had a couple books, I think, on the topic of side hustles. Thanks for the question, David. Actually, David didn't even make that question to us. I went, grabbed it because I thought this was... So interesting. So many people, especially with Vitaly here today, OG, talking about what is my calling? What am I really trying to do? Thought a good time to talk about, do I make the pivot? Do I not make the pivot? And what if, what if the universe is sending me a message here? If you've got a question for us, stackingbenjamins.com slash voicemail, and uh, we're happy to answer it. By the way, during the summer, usually a slow time, not just for us, but I also answer some questions on uh, the Ford Anything podcast. And it is a it is a time when you can get your questions answered very quickly and it picks up. So if you want it answered now, stackingbenjamins.com slash voicemail. All right. That's going to do it for today. I have just a couple more days on the road, Doug, a couple more days. So if you want to fly out and join me for a couple more of these, it would be fantastic because tonight I am in Denver. I got to say, I actually had a huge amount of fun. In those cities I went to. I mean, I make fun of it, but I, I, I did enjoy it. I didn't like the process of getting to those cities, but the actual events and hanging out with all the stackers, that was, that was pretty fun. I agree. I mean, I had, I had stackers coming up to me telling me they were naming their babies after me. It was great. And I'm definitely with you as we wind this down. The process of getting to these places, horrible. The events themselves without exception, just fantastic. And we had some great times. That photo we took in Chicago of the entire on-air team, except Len, I wish Len could have been there. Just still one of my favorite looking back over the tour with the Chicago skyline behind us. Just a fantastic oh, was memory. Was that when we were at Cliff Dwellers? Yeah. Perilously perched on the side of a yeah. rooftop. <laughs> yeah, right. No support whatsoever. No railing. Nothing. Just anything howling. could have happened. No idea. Yes. A, a slight breeze would have sent us plunging toward deaths. Thousands of stories below. Yes, I remember it. Tonight I'm in Denver. Tomorrow night I'm in Salt Lake. 
uh, the following night in Phoenix, and on, on Sunday, I will be in Las Vegas. Vegas. Stackingbenjamins.com slash stacked to hang out with us. If you're in those cities, please come out and uh, say hello. Love to love to meet our stacker friends. All right. Uh, if you're not here for that, you're here because you need to get your financial life under control. You know what? OG and his team are taking clients and you can think bigger about your goals. I think that's the big message today. You can do more. And you know what? You can, regardless of the non-compete, go out and make things happen. That's right. Stackybenjamins.com slash OG. All right. That's going to do it for today. Doug, you've got it from here, man. What should we have learned today? Well, Joe, first, it turns out life isn't just about money. You need to make it meaningful. What brings meaning to your life? Invest in those things just as much as you would your portfolio. Second, thinking about your career and making a change? Earlier is better in most cases. The longer you wait, the more you may regret not trying it out. But build your emergency fund and have a solid business plan before you jump. That's the big lesson. Turns out the hottest thing on the planet isn't OG slow walking out of the pool. It's the inside of a pizza roll fresh out of the oven. The good news is now I figured out how to exfoliate the inside of my mouth. And now everybody's trying to picture OG slowly walking up the steps of the pool with that water cascading over his belly. So hot. So just doing the hair flip. Flipping both hairs. It's, it is now. There's none of our listeners are going to sleep tonight because they're just going to be thinking about that. Thanks to Vitaly Katzenelson for joining us. His book Soul in the Game is available anywhere you go to find meaning. This show is the property of SB Podcasts LLC, copyright 2022, and is created by Joe Salcija. Our producer is Karen Repine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch with help from Joe, me, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. After you listen to our show, check out the 201 Deep Dives written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. You'll find the 411 on all things money at the 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. Here's a weird fact. Both she and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. Not only should you not take advice from these dorks, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. Welcome to the after show. Vitaly, this is the part of the show that doesn't exist. You're an honorary stalker today. So uh, what happens in the after show stays in the after show, right? We don't talk about it. Love it. If you have to talk about it, which we've had people that just, they have to, we give them a little pass. We tell them they can call it dessert, but you don't eat dessert. So you're good. Yeah, so, I'm good. Yeah, I'm <laughs> that's good. good. Today you're creating dessert, but 
I love this story from your time in Russia, and I thought this is perfect after show material. You said during our main interview about how hard it was. Sometimes the store shelves are empty. Finding enough food is is always difficult. But as Glasnost takes place in Europe and America is sending food to Russia, you <laughs> you get all this food. It is very foreign to you. And you were horrified by some of the food that you got. Like you got some absolutely oh. horrifying food. Oh my God, yeah. You were sure that Americans ate dogs. Tell me that story. Yes. <laughs> so I, I studied English in school. It's a lot of memorization, very little conversation, a lot of memorization. My vocabulary was good enough to know two words, hot and dog. So yes, the perestroika happens, gluttony and uh, glassness happens. And Americans are showering us with gifts. We get this packages sent to us. And one of the packages had this, uh, had something that says hot dog. And that word does not even exist in Russia. Like you have either sausages or links, right? But I read this and I'm like, my God. So all this propaganda was right. I mean, because Americans <laughs> eat dogs, right? Because, you know, and I couldn't believe it. And I, that it took me a while to, when I came to the United States and I realized what hot dog actually means. You know, I realized, <laughs> by the way, just when you use language, you don't think about it, right? Like think about yeah. it, hot dog. What kind of name is that? Right, right. right. <laughs> Somebody, I don't know the origin of the word, but it's a, well, I, let me give you another one. And, and this one, if you think about it very closely, it actually kind of sounds a little bit funny. Girlfriend or boyfriend. Just think about it. So I came to the United States, and my teacher, who was at the time, I was 18, and I was in high school in the United States, she had a boyfriend. And I look at her, she doesn't look like a girl to have a boyfriend. Because it's like, literally, if you think about literal translation, I think having a girlfriend is a K or a boyfriend when you are a girl or a boy. In yeah, that you're like sense. seven or seven or eight. Yes, exactly. When uh, when you become an adult, you need to change the you know, so, so the vocabulary needs to change as well, right? It needs to be like woman friend, woman friend, woman, or a man exactly. friend. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, like when you use a language from uh, and you when you're born into language, you take some of those words for granted, but when it's a new language to you and you start kind of taking it literally at first, it is uh, it has some surprises. So. So, uh, yeah, I actually have it back the other way. Okay. Yeah. So the first time I'm a Catholic boy and the first time I went to a synagogue, my fiance, now my wife's family, they are walking out, but I'm so fascinated by them putting the Torah back away that I just stand there. And then all of a sudden I realize Vitelli that I'm in the middle of a synagogue that I've never been to a synagogue before. And I'm alone. And I have this little panic attack as this guy looks at me and smiles and comes walking toward me, right? Uh, uh, uh. And I'm thinking, what am I going to say to this guy? I have no idea what to say. What am I going to say? What am I going to do? What's going to happen here? And he gets a big smile on his face. He sticks out his hand and he says, Shabbat Shalom. And I said, Joe Sihai. (laughs) <laughs> and he looks at me, and he looks at me all confused and he says like ben smith and i'm like oh i messed that. i was sure shabbat shalom was his name but <laughs> i i had actually i had a very similar experience my my kids went to uh to jewish school in denver they had a i guess in jewish uh, on hebrew in hebrew i guess uh mora is means teacher and uh they would call you know my, my kids would talk about this teacher like mora I forget, Maura, Maura Schwartz. And I thought actually, I thought Maura was her name. Was her name. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like Teacher Schwartz, right? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, when we had a teacher, parent teacher conference, I started addressing her as Maura. And she's like, no, no, my name is Nancy or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, there was, with, with my kids, there was a time that, um, I sat next to this guy at my daughter's soccer games and I don't know why Vitali, but I was sure his name was Dick. Like I was absolutely sure his first name was Dick. And so every day I'd show up at the games and I'd say, Hey Dick, how's it going? And he'd go, Hey Joe. And he's the nicest guy. And then it was much later. I'm looking over his shoulder at some check. He's getting ready to write a check. We're at this uh, fundraiser thing together. I look over his shoulder and his check says, Mark. Chevy. And I don't know. I don't know why. 
I decided his name was Dick. I have no no clue. But anyway. So I, I, I have a similar story, but it goes like uh, the, one of the guys I worked for 25 years ago, his name is Joe. He always called me not Vitali, but Vitali. And I could never bring myself to correct him that that's not my name. And this is this relationship been going for 25 years. We're still close friends. And every time he calls me Vitali, I can't bring myself to tell him that he's saying it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, and in, in this case, it's been going on for 25 years. So, yeah, uh, why well, stop now, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Well, thanks for hanging out with me for a few minutes longer. Absolutely, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. <laughs>